So we are, of course, super picky audiophiles who care a lot about sound quality in our headphones. I imagine you do too. But have you ever taken a step back and really thought about, like, what actually is good sound quality? Depending on which corner of the internet you find yourself in, you're likely to get a different answer. Some will tell you that matching this entails good sound quality. Or maybe more advanced users will tell you, no, 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 it's this or this. And of course, in other places, they'll tell you all about the technicalities, the resolution, the speed, the soundstage, and so on. These are descriptions of the sound that many of us are familiar with. But all of this is only part of the story and can even be a bit misleading. And so in this video, I want us to take a step back and really consider this question a bit more deeply. And I'm going to give you guys my take on this, at least for now. My answer might change in the future depending on new information that becomes available, but this is kind of where things are at for me for now. And yes, of course, this video is going to get very technical. So let's get started. Now, just as we get going here, this video is, of course, made possible by Headphones.com. If you like what we do here and you find it interesting or useful or valuable in some fashion, consider Headphones.com for your next audio purchase. Now, to get to the topic at hand, at its core, a statement like, this headphone sounds better than that headphone is fairly self-explanatory. Like, you, you know what I mean when I'm talking about that. Fundamentally, that's just a statement of preference about the sound that you get from one headphone to another. So you may have a preference for this kind of sound and not this kind of sound. And you can talk about the various different ways in which you might prefer it. But there's more going on here and it's worth considering. Why do you prefer it? Does everyone prefer it? If you held up two headphones and you clearly preferred one of them, would other people similarly prefer it? And the answer is not quite so straightforward. So I'm going to break down sound quality in headphones. I'm going to break that down into three different parts. Well, two parts, and then I'm going to talk about a third variable that makes it extremely difficult to understand the other two. So the first two parts are number one, listener preference, and number two, human anatomy. The third variable that messes all of this up is actually to do with headphone behavior, and I'll get to this, but let's go through the other two first. So let's start with preference. We know from the Harmon preference research that some people prefer more bass, some prefer less, and so on. And while it might be uncontroversial to say that no single frequency response is going to be preferred by everyone, how much bass a headphone has and how much treble a headphone has is highly influential in terms of the preferences that people have. And actually, when I was thinking about this topic, I was like, what, what is good sound in headphones? And I was asking some of my friends and listener was like, bass. <laughs> and I think that's probably true to a large extent for a lot of people. Now, here's the thing though. You may have found a headphone that perfectly gives you the wideband bass and treble level that you enjoy. So a proportional bass and treble level that has lots of bass and lots of treble or whatever you might like, maybe less bass depending on your preferences. But you could have two products that both satisfy this requirement, but they sound different from one another and you subjectively enjoy one of them more substantially more. So what gives? What's going on with that? So the second aspect to good sound has to do with your anatomy. And this is where things start to get complicated. So you might be thinking, well, duh, we all hear differently, but that's that's a cop out. We need to actually talk about what that means. So every person has unique features to their head, ears, torso, and these features all impact sound on its way to the eardrum. And we can actually measure and understand the effects of these features and the ways in which they contribute to what you hear. So you may have heard us talking about the head-related transfer function, or HRTF for short. That's what this is. Whenever you hear HRTF mentioned, think human anatomy, our physical ears, and other things to do with our bodies. <laughs> and every head, every ear, has a unique HRTF. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that we hear the world differently. Rather, it means that how our brains expect sound to propagate at our eardrums is going to be different for every person based on the physical features of our anatomy, primarily our head and ears in this case. And that might make you think, well, then what's the point of measuring anything? Measurement rigs are a single condition. They're only one head and one set of ears. And there is some truth to this. The measurement rig's anatomy isn't a perfect match to yours or mine. It's meant to be anthropometric. It's meant to be human-like, but not necessarily resolve-like. <laughs> but it's also not a matter of anything goes here. We're talking about human anatomy, where we all, generally speaking, have heads and ears. And this is really why measurement rigs are designed to be as human-like as possible. A head and torso simulator, a HATS, is a simulator because it's trying to recreate the condition of these products being used by humans as best as possible. So you don't have a head and torso simulator for a dog. 
Well, maybe there, maybe that exists, but that's, that's not what we're measuring headphones on. So even though the physical features of the rigs, head and ears are bound to be slightly different from yours or mine, sound is still being impacted by a human-like head and ears on its way to the eardrum. And that's where we're taking the measurement. And if you're wondering what that looks like, these are the effects of a head and ears on incoming sound. Here's the ear canal's contribution and here's the pinna's contribution. And we've gone over some of this stuff in the past as well. And this is why when you look at a raw graph of headphone frequency response, you see the rise up here like this. And we call this the ear gain because it's all the contributions of the ear. So the canal, the pinna, etc., cetera, uh, to the sound along the path to the eardrum. So here you can see the response of two different ears in the same condition, this one being the gross ear that we use commonly, and this one being the BNK5 and 28's ear. Notice that they are different from one another, but they both have a similar rise that goes up. Again, the ear gain. And this is what sounds normal to these two ears. And once again, they're both designed to be anthropometric. And if these rigs could talk, they would be able to tell you about how they hear these products. And they would definitely tell you all about the technicalities, the resolution, the soundstage of whatever headphones they bought recently, because just like you, they also love purchase validation. <laughs> okay, that's just me being silly. But really, we should think of measurements as what the rig heard. And if we could measure at our own eardrums, it would give us a picture of what each of us heard. While those pictures are necessarily going to be different, there are going to be similarities. Similarities that trend around the fact that we all typically have heads and ears that are impacting the sound. So there are different shapes of human ears out there, but they are all still ear-like in some fashion. Now, if we back up again to the two headphones that have similarly preferable levels of bass and treble, some people might tell you that one sounds better than the other because it's got a more resolving driver or better technicalities or some other unmeasurable thing or currently not measured thing. And the thing is, it does actually sound like this. But what's likely going on here is that one of them is just a better fit relative to your HRTF than the other. So a better fit with what your brain expects to hear based on the effects of your physical head and ears. So this isn't just about bass and treble, it's a better fit with the fine-grained effects imparted by your anatomy. Now, I just wanna note that I'm saying this is only a possibility and not guaranteed. And it's also where I have to go into the realm of anecdote because that's how this is for me. So when I'm able to achieve achieve a better fit with what my brain expects, that leads to a better sense of overall clarity, transparency, an unveiling of sorts, right? The, that actually makes the music sound significantly more technical, and I'm able to now think of it in those terms. But there are definitely those who might be more drawn to headphones that have more colorations, so headphones that are deliberately imparting some kind of editorialization on the sound. And that's not a bad thing, that's literally just preference. A good example is Cameron on our team likes the Abyss AB1266, which has a truly wild frequency response, but he likes it in large part because of its unique colorations. I would say specifically because of its unique colorations. And to further that point, when it comes to our general understanding of listener preference, we have a good grasp on what people like in terms of coarse-grained and wideband information, not so much when it comes to the fine-grained features. So preference there is still a bit, of a, a bit of a mystery. So if it's possible for there to be preference for tasteful colorations, we don't know what that is. But at the very least, our individual anatomy, the effects of our head and ears on incoming sound are key factors when it comes to what makes things sound good or bad, because they're also key factors when it comes to how we just hear these products. Now, to the third part, the weird one, and this is what messes everything up, and it ruins everything that I just said. It's what most people are not aware of because we're so used to headphone performance being shown as a line on a graph. And get ready, because I'm about to ruin all of that for you. Finally, we get to talk about the technicalities. No, I'm joking. I'm talking, of course, about how the behavior of headphones themselves change depending on the effect that the anatomy of the listener has on the headphone in close proximity. So just think about that for a second. The actual behavior of the headphone changes from head to head, and the degree to which the headphones change and in what ways is also variable. Now, if you've been following us for a while, you might be familiar with this already, but for those who haven't seen this yet, I'm about to break your brain a bit. So the measured behavior of a headphone is what's called the headphone transfer function, or HPTF for short. But in our case, we want to go one step further. What we're interested in is actually non-HRTF related HPTF, or simply the variation in a headphone's measured response that isn't due to HRTF, that isn't due to a person's unique effects imparted by the head and ears. And I should note, all of this is still at the stage where we need to do more research and we also haven't yet done these tests ourselves 
This is partly why we've been doing things like getting MRI scans of our actual ears. But there is already a large body of evidence pointing in the direction of non-HRTF related HPTF being a major factor when it comes to people literally hearing these products differently. And to explain this, let's take a look at the Sennheiser HG800S. This is one of the most open and positionally consistent headphones on the market, and also one that has extremely tight tolerances for unit variation. And this is a headphone that, to me, sounds a bit shrill in the treble, and I've been particularly critical of treble peaks that I hear when it comes to this headphone. So here's a measurement of the HD800S, and we might say, well, that's just how it performs. See the excess treble energy here? This seems to confirm how it is that I hear it. However, our acoustics engineer Blaine doesn't hear this peak at all. So is this how it performs? Are his ears just broken? Does he have anti-sibilance built in? Maybe, maybe he's just broken. Okay, bye. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a measurement of that same HD800S on a different head, this time on the BMK5128, which has the more accurate acoustic impedance, so it's even more human-like. Is this the truth about how this headphone performs? You can see there is still excess treble energy, but it's not exactly the same as it is on the Gross head. There are some differences here. Now, let's take a look at an HD800S measured on multiple people. And for this, we have to go to the Hutubs database. <laughs> And I'll leave the resources in the description for this if you want to check it out yourself. So this measurement shows a single HD800S measured on 30 people at the blocked ear canal entrance. This alone shows a wide variety of differences between subjects, but we don't know how much of the difference here would also be present in the HRTFs of these listeners as well. Again, people have different shapes to their ears and heads and so on. So what you're seeing here is effectively just multiple HPTFs. Uh, but the question we're interested in is, well, how much is the headphone's behavior itself changing due to the ear it was placed on? Thankfully, these 30 human subjects first had their HRTFs measured, and then immediately had the headphones measured with the microphones remaining in the same place. Which, microphone placement is also another variable here. Um, that's a whole thing, not for this video. But this means that we can do what we typically call diffuse field compensation. We can subtract the HRTF effects from the measurements to isolate the way that the headphone's behavior is shaped by that ear in that circumstance, irrespective of how that ear typically impacts incoming sound. And that leaves us with this. All of these measurements of the HD800S have had their individual HRTFs subtracted from the measurement. So the people whose ears they were measured on, their anatomy effects have been subtracted from this. So to reiterate, we're not seeing differences in human anatomy here, not differences in HRTFs, as we have subtracted all of those differences. Instead, what we're seeing here is solely the headphone transfer functions, or HPTFs, of the HD800S measured on 30 different people, isolated from the HRTF differences their anatomy would typically impart. And while you do see a common trend among the lot of them, the variation above 5 to 6 kHz gets pretty damn wide, and definitely wide enough to explain why two people might hear a headphone differently, regardless of preference and regardless of their HRTF. So for example, let's take a look at this one. While I personally hear this headphone as being particularly shrill around 6 kHz, it might be something kind of like this result here, this, this listener might hear it the way that I do. But here's an example of another listener who might literally not hear a peak at all either because there is no six kilohertz peak on their head or because the peak is present in their HRTF and thus perceptually it fits into their brain's expectation of normal. Now if we're to compensate all of these measurements to the average of all of them to see how widely a single headphone could vary across heads while removing any other differences like the seal related differences below 200 hertz, we see that even headphones that are supposed to be very consistent across listeners are gonna vary much more significantly, particularly above three kilohertz than many of us may have thought. And this means that what might sound normal or good or even perfect to one of us can sound different, bad, or straight up wrong to another person. And if this is true, it's not just because that sound signature wasn't to their preference or because it wasn't a good fit with their HRTF, but because the headphone itself is literally behaving differently between heads. Now, all of this is of course stuff we're still in the process of researching and there's a lot more to be tested here. Uh, again, I'll leave the resources in the description for this one if you guys are curious. But as I mentioned, the reason we've done the MRIs 
is we'd very much like to get to a point where we can have physical versions of our own ears to measure headphones on because that would allow us to get an even stronger sense of this of this kind of variation beyond just the blocked canal data that we see here that's done with in-ear mics and note that with blocked canal data you aren't including the canal effects there either so there's more to do here but at the very least even when comparing headphones on the existing ear simulators we currently have we can see the HPTF variation in practice and things are pointing in the direction of this phenomenon being highly influential in the reception of these products across listeners. So in my view, there are a few key takeaways to consider here. Well, probably more, but these are the ones that are on my mind. So number one is that what's been traditionally attributed to preference could actually be more down to the fact that people are literally hearing these products quite differently from one another, uh, in part because the headphones are actually behaving differently on different heads. So where one might have a massive treble peak and it's gonna be perceived as super bright or peaky to another person, that's not gonna even be there at all. And it's not that they have a different preference for treble, it's that they just are hearing these things differently. Um, they could still also have a different preference for treble, but a lot of this has maybe been mis misattributed. So it very much could be the case that, you know, people's genuine preferences may actually be closer to one another if HRTF and HPTF variation is accounted for. Number two is that, unfortunately, good sound quality is a harder thing to predict for people uh, than just using a single line on a graph may indicate, right? So people might be used to using a single line on a graph to indicate headphone performance, and it's much more complicated to actually predict that performance given some of this variation that we see. We need to at some point be able to show the ways in which these products can vary across listeners so people can better understand how it might sound to them and the potential range of sound that they might get. We're working on that. Number three is that this explains some of the disconnect between the sides of the community that very much are not into the graphs and measurements. So there's often been this disconnect between those who, you know, rely on measurements and focus on measurements and those who say there's more to the experience than what the graph shows. And that's whether we're talking about, you know, technicalities or other subjective qualities. In my view, understanding this and how frequency response propagates at the eardrums of individual people has the potential to bridge that gap. I'm not so naive to think that this is gonna ultimately solve all those debates because people are still gonna believe what they believe, but for many of us who weren't satisfied with the existing paradigm of single line indicating headphone performance on a graph, this goes a long way to explaining how some of these things sound different from what we see on the graph uh, to us, right, to individual people. And lastly, we need to fundamentally shift how we think about graphs in their current form. Yes, we measure on multiple rigs, multiple heads for exactly this reason, but there are many other places out there showing graphs where people think, hey, this is the truth about how these products perform. This is a statement of truth about this product in all conditions. When in reality, it's only a partial truth. It's only the truth in the condition of being on that particular head and ears. The graphs are still highly valuable in getting a sense of how a human could hear these products, but people are erroneously treating them as how all humans hear these products. And worse yet, when there's a poor fit between what the graph shows and how someone actually hears it, this tends to prompt people to start looking at all the other metrics like time domain information and harmonic distortion, you know, to explain their experiences that for the most part are meaningless. Like unless something is really broken, those things don't mean anything because they're not perceptually relevant or they're just worse ways of looking at the same thing. Or in some cases, people will just dismiss all the data entirely and have to take random subjective reports at face value. And that is, that is not a good outcome. Yeah, I've been doing this long enough to know that we are in a much better place now than we were in the in the before times without something to anchor our sense of what how these products perform. So let me be clear, the measurements are good, they're just not good enough, and we need to do more. <laughs> and that brings me to my conclusion, which is that we need more heads and ears. We're working on that. <laughs> but I've left a link in the description for a deeper presentation on this topic. It's a seminar at CanGem presented by my colleague Blaine. And if you're confused by any of what I've just said here, heaven help you if you try and make any sense of that. No, I'm kidding. Please go watch that presentation because it covers a lot of this a lot more thoroughly and it is actually more accessible than what you may think. Um, he's actually currently in the process of giving that presentation again, but I figured uh, I would leave it in the, in the description for you guys if you want to learn more about this. And it is also a glimpse of what headphone measurements done more comprehensively could look like. And I'm excited to push in that direction and build something out that allows us to do this. 
Anyways, that is all that I have to say on this topic for now. Hopefully you guys found it interesting. If you did, consider subscribing. Give the video a like if you if you liked it or not, if you didn't. But definitely leave a comment down below letting us know what you think of all of this stuff. As always, if you want to chat with me or other like-minded Wiggly Air people, check out our forum, check out our Discord. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Bye for now.